Chemistry is a study of matter, so let's see what matter actually is. The definition of matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. That pretty much covers anything in everyday life, from the air we breathe to the water we drink. A person could literally point to anything that this definition would fit. With such a sweeping definition, chemists put matter into different categories with more meaningful and detailed descriptions. Some of these categories include atoms, elements, and compounds. Atoms are the building blocks of matter. Each element is made up of the same atom. A compound is made of two or more different kinds of elements. We will get more detail on each category of matter in Chapter 2. For now, I just wanted it to be clear that matter is broken down into more defined categories. Matter can exist in three basic forms, which are called solids, liquids, and gases. These are called states of matter. Characteristics that determine states of matter are the rearrangement of the particles, the energy of the particles, and the distance between particles. Looking at solids, particles of solids are tightly packed and vibrate about a fixed position. Solids have a defined shape and a defined volume. When heat is added to a solid, the state of matter goes from a solid to a liquid. When matter is at a liquid state, particles are still tightly packed but far enough apart to slide over one another. Liquids have an indefinite shape and a definite volume. When heat is applied to a liquid, a liquid goes from a liquid to a gas. Once matter has reached a gas state, particles are very far apart and move freely. Gases have an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume, meaning they can be compressed. Let's sum up states of matter with this slide, starting with gases. The particles are in total disorder. There is a lot of empty space between particles. Particles have complete freedom of motion, and particles are far apart. Gases go from gases to liquids by cooling and or an increase in pressure. Looking at the characteristics of liquids, you can see that there's still some disorder. Particles or clusters of particles are free to move or slide past each other. Particles are still together. Liquids go to a solid state by cooling. And going the other way, liquids go to a gaseous state by adding heat and or reducing pressure. Solids have particles with a more ordered arrangement. Particles are closer together than they are with liquids. And particles are in a fixed position and cannot move freely past each other. A solid reaches a liquid state by adding heat. Energy plays a central and key role in chemistry. Energy is involved when a bird flies, a bomb explodes, rain falls from the sky, and when electricity flows through a wire. Energy is all around you. You can hear energy as sound, you can see energy as light, and you can feel energy as wind. You use energy when you hit a softball, when you lift up a book bag, or when you compress a spring. If energy is involved in so many things and so important in chemistry, what is energy? Energy can be defined as the ability to do work. If an object or organism does work, meaning that it exerts a force over a distance to move an object, the object or organism uses energy. So we defined energy as the ability to do work. And we define work as exerting a force over a distance to move an object. So what do we mean by that? If this was an object and a force was pressed on it, 
and that force moved the object a certain distance, that would be work. Because of the direct connection between energy and work, energy is measured in the same units as work, which has a joule unit. We defined energy as the ability to do work, and we define work as a force that it moves an object to a distance, or we could use the equation W equals F times D, W being work and F being force and D being distance. So another way to write that, force times distance is what is called a joule. One joule equals Newton meter. And if we take this and plug in a Newton for force and a meter for the distance, then we have the definition of work. So a brief summary, we said that energy was the ability to do work. We described work as a force that pushes an object over a distance or a force times distance. So we could rewrite this as energy is a force times distance. We took the joule unit, one joule equals one newton meter, where the newton force would be plugged into F, and the meter would be plugged into the distance. So using that, we would have energy could be measured in newton meters. And one newton meter equals one joule. And we could rewrite this as energy is equal to joules, or can be measured in joules. In addition to using energy to do work, objects can gain energy because work is being done to them. For example, if we had an object at the bottom of a ramp, and a force was applied to the object, moving it a distance to reach the top, we could say energy was used on the object. And energy was added to the object when it went from one height to another height through what is called gravitational energy. The five main forms of energy are heat energy, chemical energy, electromagnetic energy, nuclear energy, and mechanical energy. The internal motion of an atom is called heat energy because moving particles produce heat. Heat energy can be produced by friction. Heat energy causes changes in temperature and phase of any form of atom. Chemical energy is required to bond atoms together. And when bonds are broken, energy is released. Fuel and food are forms of stored chemical energy. Power lines carry electromagnetic energy into your home in the form of electricity. Light is a form of electromagnetic energy. Each color of light represents a different amount of electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic energy is also carried in x-rays, radio waves, and laser light. The nucleus of an atom is a source of nuclear energy. When a nucleus splits, 
also called fission, nuclear energy is released in the form of heat energy and light energy. Nuclear energy is also released when nuclei collide at high speeds and join, which is called fuse. The sun's energy is produced from a nuclear fusion reaction in which hydrogen nuclei fuse to form helium nuclei. Nuclear energy is the most concentrated form of energy. When work is done to an object, it acquires energy. The energy it acquires is known as mechanical energy. When you kick a football, you give mechanical energy to the football to make it move. Energy can change from one form to another. Changes in the form of energy are called energy conversions. It is important to realize that some of the science we stand on today was done by scientists hundreds of years ago. And what may seem like a small paragraph in a textbook or a simple concept could have taken a lifetime for the scientists to map out. This is why some chemistry concepts are described in such archaic frameworks. Scientists describe the world around them as it was and built from tried and true studies. Energy conversions can help close the gap between work done hundreds of years ago and work that is being done today. All forms of energy can be converted into other forms. The sun's energy through solar cells can be converted directly into electricity. Green plants convert the sun's energy, which is electromagnetic, into starches and sugars, which is chemical energy. In an automobile engine, fuel is burned to convert chemical energy into heat energy. The heat energy is then changed into mechanical energy. An energy state is energy with specific conditions that is often described relatively. Relatively meaning compared to something else, usually described as energy that is higher or lower. The most common energy conversion is the conversion between potential and kinetic energy. All forms of energy can be in either of two states, potential or kinetic. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Potential energy is stored energy. The equation for kinetic energy is Ke equals m for mass times v squared for velocity squared divided by 2. So looking at the equation, what has a greater effect on kinetic energy, mass or velocity, and why? We had two variables, m for mass and v for velocity. Velocity has an exponent right here. This means that velocity would have a much greater effect on kinetic energy than mass. Potential energy is stored energy, stored chemically in fuel, the nucleus of an atom, and in foods, or because of the work done on it. Examples of this would be stretching a rubber band, winding a watch, pulling back a bow's arrow, or lifting a brick high in the air. Potential energy that is dependent on height is called gravitational potential energy. Energy that is stored due to being stretched or compressed is called elastic potential energy. Roller coasters work because of the energy that is built into the system. Initially, the car is pulled mechanically up the tall hill, giving them a great deal of potential energy. From that point, the conversion between potential and kinetic energy powers the car through the entire ride. So when we look at this cartoon, we can see that when the cart is at the top of the roller coaster, it has the most potential energy. And when it's at the bottom of the hill, it has the most kinetic energy. As the cart goes down the hill, the potential energy decreases and the kinetic energy increases. And as it goes up the hill, the potential energy increases and the kinetic energy decreases. Looking at a common everyday event, 
As a basketball player throws a ball into the air, various energy conversions take place. The law of conservation of energy is an important law to grasp and understand when studying chemistry. The law of conservation of energy says that energy can neither be created nor destroyed by ordinary means. An example of something that is not ordinary would be a nuclear bomb. This law says that energy can only be converted from one form to another. An example of this was with potential and kinetic energy. When we describe this with the roller coaster, the cart had more potential energy at the top of the hill, and as it went to the bottom of the hill, the potential energy decreased and the kinetic energy increased. So the energy was not lost, it converted from one form to another. If energy does seem to disappear, scientists look for it, leading to many important discoveries. It was mentioned that the law of conservation of energy was true under ordinary means, hinting there is something more to the story, and there is. Under certain extraordinary circumstances, such as those involving a nuclear reaction or high-speed particles, energy can indeed be converted into mass, and mass can be converted back into energy. In 1905, Albert Einstein said that mass and energy can be converted into each other. He showed that if matter is destroyed, energy is created, and if energy is destroyed, mass is created. This was under his famous equation, E equals mc squared. Scientists came up with a measuring system that could be universally understood. The International System of Units, also called SI units, or a globally agreed basis of measurement. There are no Chinese measuring units or French measuring units. SI units are a sort of globally understood language that expresses units of measurement. The SI base units for mass is a kilo, for length it's a meter, for time it's a second, for temperature it's a kelvin, the amount of substance is a mole, electric current is an ampere, and for luminescent intensity is a candela. Prefixes are used to indicate decimal fractions or multiples of various units. For example, the prefix milli represents 10 to the negative third fraction of a unit, meaning that it would divide it by 1,000. So a milligram is 10 to the negative third grams, or 1 gram divided by 1,000. A millimeter is 10 to the negative third meters, which would be 1 meter divided by 1,000. These are common prefixes used in chemistry. Although non-SI units are being phased out, there are still some commonly used by scientists, such as Celsius, a gallon, and a pound. By definition, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in the sample. This is similar to rubbing the palm of your hand on a carpet and moving it back and forth very fast the palm of your hand will get warmer. With chemistry, when two particles collide, they do the same thing when one particle rubs against the other one, which is called friction. So if we had a container with a lot of these particles in it, when two of these particles would rub against each other, they would create friction, which would make it hotter. So the average of all these particles rubbing together collectively would give you a temperature. SI units are used to derive other quantities, such as pressure, speed, and force. For example, speed is defined as the ratio of distance to elapsed time. So the SI units for speed would be distance, which would be given in meters, and time, which would be given in seconds, giving us meters per second. Other derived SI units would be the Newton and the Pascal. The most commonly used metric unit for volume are the liter and the milliliter. A liter is a cube one decimeter long on each side. A milliliter is a cube one centimeter long on each side. One thing that should be recognized is one cubic centimeter is exactly one milliliter, and one cubic decimeter is exactly one liter. Density is a physical property of a substance. It's defined as the amount of mass in a unit volume of the substance. The densities in solids and liquids are commonly expressed in grams per cubic centimeter or grams per milliliter. Some of the fundamental properties that chemists measure include mass, length, time, and temperature. Derived quantities of measurement include density, velocity, and force. 
in SI, the base unit for length or linear measure is the meter, denoted as lowercase m. All measurements of length can be expressed in meters. For very large or very small lengths, however, it may be more convenient to use a unit of length that has a prefix. This is a table of prefixes. For the most part, chemists will stay in this area. Maybe go to micro, up to kilo, where micro is 1 million times smaller than the unit it precedes, and kilo is 1,000 times larger than the unit it precedes. When a prefix milli is put in front of a unit of measurement, such as meter, because milli was 10 to the negative third, it divides the meter into 1,000. So millimeter is a meter divided 1,000 times, which would arrive at 0 0.001 meters. A hyphen measures about one millimeter. For large distances, it is most appropriate to express measurements in kilometers, denoted as km. The prefix kilo means 1,000, so one kilometer equals 1,000 meters. The space occupied by a sample of matter is called its volume. You calculate the volume of any cubic or rectangular solid by multiplying the length by its width by its height. The unit of volume is thus derived from the units of length. The SI unit of volume is the amount of space occupied by a cube that is one meter along each side. This volume is a cubic meter. A more convenient unit of volume for everyday use is a liter, a non-SI unit. A liter is the volume of a cube that is 10 centimeters along each edge. So 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters equals 1,000 cubic centimeters, or 1 liter. A smaller non-SI unit of volume is the milliliter, denoted as lowercase m and uppercase l. One milliliter is one one-thousandth of a liter. Thus, there are 1,000 milliliters in one liter, because one liter is defined as 1,000 cubic centimeters. One milliliter and one cubic centimeter are the same volume. The units milliliter and cubic centimeter are thus used interchangeably. The relationship among common metric units of volume are shown on the table below. One liter is about the same as a quart of milk. A milliliter is about 20 drops of water. A cubic centimeter is about the same size as a cube of sugar. And a microliter is about the size of a crystal of salt. The mass of an object is measured in comparison to the standard mass of one kilogram, which is the base SI unit of mass. A kilogram was originally defined as the mass of one liter of water at 4 degrees Celsius. A cube of water at 4 degrees Celsius measuring 10 centimeters on each edge would have the volume of one liter and the mass of 1,000 grams or one kilogram. A gram is one thousandths of a kilogram. The mass of one cubic centimeter of water at 4 degrees Celsius is one gram. Here are some relationships of units of mass and things that we're familiar with. One textbook is about one kilogram. A dollar bill weighs about one gram. Ten grains of salt weighs about one milligram. And a particle of baking powder is about one microgram. Weight is a force that measures the pull on a given mass by gravity. Weight a measure of force is different from mass, which is a measure of the quantity of matter. The weight of an object can change with its location. An astronaut in orbit is weightless, but an astronaut is not massless. Temperature is a measure of how hot or cold an object is. An object's temperature determines the direction of heat transfer. When two objects of different temperatures are in contact, heat moves from one object of higher temperature to the object of lower temperature. Almost all substances expand with the increase in temperature and contract as the temperature decreases. A very important exception is water. These properties are the very basis for the common bulb thermometer. The liquid in the thermometer expands and contracts more than the volume of the glass, producing changes in the column height of the liquid.
When mass is measured in grams and volume in cubic centimeters, density has units of grams per cubic centimeter, denoted as g divided by cm to the third power. The SI unit for density is kilograms per cubic meter, denoted as kg for kilograms divided by m for meters to the third power. This figure compares densities of four substances, lithium, water, aluminum, and lead. And going from left to right, the densities increase, which you can see on the bottom row here. So these increase. And if you notice on the top row with the fractions, all the substances are 10 grams of mass. But the bottom part of the fraction, the volume is, decreases going from left to right. So what this is saying as density increases, the volume decreases for the same amount of mass. Because the difference in densities, liquids separate in layers. As shown on the right, corn oil floats on top of the water because it is less dense. And corn syrup sinks below the water because it is more dense. So what that's saying is, as we go closer to the bottom, the more the density increases, and from the previous slide, we determined that when density increases, less volume is required for the same amount of mass. So this bottom layer would require less volume for a mass, and this top layer would require more volume for a mass. The denotation for density is often given the Greek letter rho, which looks like this. Looks like a P, but it's a Greek letter rho. So we said that the density for water was one gram per milliliter, per one milliliter. When the density or rho is less than one, it will float on top of the water. And when the density rho is more than one, it will sink. Density is defined as mass per unit volume. For example, a mass density of fresh water equals 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter or one ton per cubic meter. Salt water equals 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter, or 1.025 tons per cubic meter. Specific gravity or relative density of a substance is defined as the ratio of weight of the substance to the weight of an equal volume of fresh water. Specific gravity is denoted as SG, and relative density is denoted as Rd. We would get the specific gravity or the relative density by putting the density of the substance in the numerator and putting the density of fresh water in the denominator, which would be 1000. With the list below, we could simply plug in the different densities to get the specific gravity or the relative density. So for salt water, we would put 1025 which would give us a specific gravity or relative density of 1.025. Using oil, which would be 900 kilograms per cubic meter, we would then divide that by 1,000, which would come out to be 0 0.9. And for fresh water, it's 1,000. So 1,000 divided by 1,000 is 1. Scientific method is a process that is used to find answers to questions about the world around us. First, we choose a problem. We state the problem as a question. Then we research the problem. We read, get advice, and make observations. Next, we develop a hypothesis. We make a prediction about what will happen. Then we design an experiment to plan how you will test your hypothesis. Then we test the hypothesis. We conduct an experiment and record the data. Next, we organize the data. We create a chart or a graph of the data. And last, we draw a conclusion to analyze your data and summarize the findings.